So I was telling Sandy that I vividly remember being in this class, this type of setting, sitting here, you know, what, gosh, it's been eight years ago, um, almost not actually nine years ago, sitting in your guys' chairs and thinking, okay, some of you are in your last semester of school, some of you are in your junior year, whatever year you're in, and, you know, there is a big, wide open, big world out there, you know, real world out there, and so um, Sandy and I are going to talk just a little bit about that. Um, um, you know, just kind of transitioning from being in college to being out in the real world and what that all looks like and what that entails. So, um, so I thought this would be kind of neat. Sandy and I are going to show you what we looked like in college because back in the day we used to actually be pretty cool too before we started wearing suits and ties and actually being professionals. So that's what I looked like back in college. I was pretty cool. I was in a band. I had longer hair. I was a little bit different, you know, and tried to be super cool, and so in nine years, I go from being that guy to being this guy. Um, so, you know, there is kind of a transitionary stage where, you know, you're going to get out of college and you're going to start being a professional, and that entails, you know, a couple different just life changes for you. One of those being appearance, you know, and we're going to talk a little bit about that and appearance in a professional environment, specifically what we look like at Enterprise. And, um, so that's what I looked like back in the day. So still a pretty cool guy. I still feel like I'm a pretty cool guy. Probably not that cool. But, um, you know, everybody kind of goes through that, that life transition going through school. Um, or actually when you leave school and eventually you have to go and get a job. That's what you guys pay money for and that's what you work for. Um, you know, what was great was I, I stopped paying to come to school and stopped paying to do work. And now somebody pays me to do work. And so that's what I was really excited about was starting to see the benefits of my education start paying off, which was pretty cool. So, so that's me. This is Sandy. That's what Sandy looked like when she was in college. So again, fun loving, had a great time, you know, but eventually had the transition to being out in the real world. And so that's what we're here to talk to you guys a little bit about today. So first, just to tell you a little bit about Enterprise. Anybody heard of Enterprise Rent a Car? Yes, yes, okay. We're the largest rental car company in the world. Um, if you take all of our competitors, if you take Avis, Hertz, Budget, Dollar, anybody that you think of, if you combine all of them, they're still smaller than what we are as a company. So we, uh, we are a transportation solution company. Mainly the biggest part of that is being we're a rental car company. Now, when I graduated from college, the first thing that I didn't, that I, you know, or as I was growing up, you know, when you say I want to be a firefighter or a policeman, renting cars doesn't kind of go through your mind when you're putting that together. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, a lot of companies that you're going to look at, you know, you never thought you'd sell this widget or you never thought you would, you know, work in this type of an environment. But majority of the time, it's just, it, it is working as a team and, work, and being a good team member and being involved some way, shape, or form, whatever. If you're finance or management, you're, you're still part of that. The company is just the vehicle that you do that through. So we're the largest rental car company in North America. Um, we were founded in 1957 by Jack Taylor. We're a privately held company, so we are not publicly traded. We are family owned and operated. We have been since day one. And we feel like that allows us to make some faster moves without having to go through a board of directors, um, you know, or go through a shareholders meeting or something like that to get something accomplished with some of which other companies have to. So we're one of the largest privately held companies in the world. Uh, we were named after the USS Enterprise. We've also got a pretty large military heritage out there. Jack served on the USS Enterprise uh, in World War II, and when he came back, he started a rental car company. So we started with a fleet of seven cars in the St. Louis Cadillac dealership. We now have 7,000 locations. We did $19 billion in revenue last year, uh, and we have currently one and a half million vehicles in the fleet. So really quick in you know, close to 60 years, we've gone from seven cars to one and a half million cars. We have a lot of different divisions that help us do that. Uh, we're in 75 countries, and we also we own Enterprise National and Alamo Rent-A-Cars. So we have three brands that we own. Um, the National and the Alamo brand are primarily at the airports. And then the Enterprise brand, you guys, maybe if you're driving through Beaumont, you see them, they're kind of the around the neighborhood, around the block uh, rental car company, and that's what we do there. So uh, advancement and just my career history, and I'm sure Sandy will tell you a little bit about hers too. Uh, but really, our company is all about advancement, and we have a management trainee program. We have two programs. One, we have an internship that eventually bleeds into a management trainee program. But our management trainee program, we, we, our thought is even when you graduate from college, you're not a finished product. And so we give you a lot of training, a lot of tools and tips and help and 
along the way in order to develop into basically being a store manager, um, an area manager, um, you know, regional manager and regional vice president, which is my title. So I'm a regional vice president up there at the top. So my territory extends all the way um, from basically NRG Stadium in Houston, all the way down to Lake Jackson, then all the way out to Beaumont. This is about as far east as, as my territory goes. There's three other guys like me that oversee the city of, um, of Houston, uh, just in different parts of, of the territory. So I oversee about 45 rental car locations uh, with seven area managers that report up to me and then a bunch of other department heads like Sandy that help us uh, behind the scenes from an administrative standpoint too. So uh, really the management training path is where everybody starts. 99% of our employees start as a management trainee. And so our thought and our model is, um, you know, how is your boss going to teach you how to do your job if they've never done it before? And there's other companies that outsource and bring in somebody above somebody else to try to teach them how to do their job, but it's in a completely different business, maybe a different industry. And so, you know, you see as a management trainee, these are the folks that one day scale up into the branch manager and assistant manager rank. So your branch manager used to do your job. So if you have a problem or you're going through a struggle or a challenge or you know, you're trying to move your career forward and maybe it's not happening as fast as you want to, your manager has great insight into how to help make you better and shape you. So that's one of the nuts and bolts of what our philosophy is based on. Even our CEO, uh, Pam Nicholson, who's one of the, what, she's top 30 most powerful women in the country. Um, she started out as a management trainee 32 years ago in Southern California. So she is the true management trainee all the way up the chain. And so that's what, what we pride ourselves on, is we give you a, a path on how to get there. There's no glass ceilings along the way. Um, we are a pay for performance company and promote for performance company. So it's a level playing field, and if you're super competitive, super motivated, um, it, it's something that, that is, you know, could tailor very well to what you do. So my career path, so I started out as a management trainee nine years ago in Indiana. I graduated from Indiana University as a finance major. Uh, and really started going to work for Enterprise probably six months after I graduated. You guys saw the band pictures. I was in a band and tried to do that for about six months, and then that kind of tapered off, and I said, oh, I actually, I, this growing up thing is actually real, so I have to do it. So I went to work for Enterprise. I took uh, my management test so to graduate from being a trainee. I took that in about seven months, and then I moved to management assistant. I was a management assistant for two days, uh, management assistant is just what we call folks that are waiting around to interview for assistant manager positions. And then I became an assistant manager. Uh, six months later, I was a branch manager. So at a year, I became a branch manager with the company. Uh, we start our management trainees at $40,000 a year. But what you want to pay attention to also is that within 12 months time, our branch managers are making $54,000. So very quickly, you get up to a, you know, you get a first promotion, and each one of these levels has a pay increase along with it. Many of our senior level branch managers are making somewhere between 65 and about 80, somewhere in that ballpark, if you're managing maybe a big location or multiple locations. Area manager, um, I, got, I hit that in three years with the company. So area manager is six figures and above. That's $100,000 or above, very, very competitive pay. Um, you can support you, your spouse, you know, your family. Um, sometimes on one income, and you, you can be just fine. So uh, area manager and above, that was about three years. And then uh, three years later, I became a regional rental manager. I actually moved to Montana to oversee a five-state region out there for enterprise. Um, kind of big, wide open spaces. It was a great place to be. Lots of outdoor activities. It was a fun time. Um, but regional rental managers are kind of in the 200000 and above. And then regional vice presidents are kind of in the 250, 300, and all the way up to about a million bucks or so. So that's kind of the scale of what the pay looks like with our company. Um, certainly comes with hard work, dedication, effort, and energy. You know, that doesn't stop when you, when you leave school. Um, but that's a little bit about just the career path and the, and the company in general. We also have an internship program, too, that maybe Sandy will talk about a little bit. See, that's available to you kind of in your junior year during the summer. It's a paid internship. I said paid. We actually pay you to work uh, during your internship, and really it's the first three months of our management training program that we put you through. Uh, many of our interns stay on during the school year too and work part-time, and they continue to work towards their qualifications to get promoted to a, uh, an assistant manager. So you could graduate, and I've had folks graduate, and within three months of graduation they become an assistant manager because they've really stayed with us throughout the year 
and they've, they've put in some, some effort outside of just going to, to school and uh, either graduate or ready to become an assistant manager pretty fast. So, any questions about career path and what we do? Do you guys get um, some fun little treats if you ask questions? It's a very interactive PowerPoint presentation. So we have some balls and some stress balls <laughs> in this test and some cars. So I'm welcome. I don't throw well, but I also try not to hit you. Okay. Question? When you say that you have to move locations to move up, or is it pretty much you can stay in the same area? Yeah, you can pretty much stay in the same area. Actually, the first move really that happens with the company is regional rental manager. And at that point, you're normally six, seven years into your career, maybe even more. And uh, sometimes you don't even have to move for that position. It's a little bit more rare, but um, you know you do relocate. But that's a lot of times at the you know the higher level. I mean, if you if you want to make two hundred thousand dollars a year, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, I think a lot of us would raise our hand and say, hey, you know, send me wherever you want to send me because I'll go. And that's what a lot of our folks do is they go, yeah, I'll I'll make that kind of money and pick up and move. That's okay. Yeah, and enterprise is really good about paying for your move. Then. Yep. Yeah, we have a full relocation package. The company will actually uh, help you sell your home, pay realtor commissions. You get a um, like a miscellaneous bonus of five thousand um, bucks. They pay for you to go, you know, go house hunting. They pay for the movement of all your stuff. So it's it's a really really great um, moving package, even when you do have to move. So. Anybody else? Yeah. What? made you, I mean, I know you said you run a fan, so what made yeah. you decide to go? Yeah, so, you know, what I love about our company is it is, it, it has a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. So what I mean by that is you're a true business owner, and that's what I really liked about my band, is I was the guy that booked all of our shows, I ordered our merchandise, I, you know, I was kind of the businessman of that, but it was my own little small business, and that's what I really liked about it. And when you're when you're a branch manager at Enterprise, I mean, you're literally, you are walking in the door, you're turning the keys every morning, you control the sales and the profits and the growth of your branch, and you also get paid a commission off of that. So when you're a branch manager, you get a base salary of, I wanna say it's about $30,000 a year, and then the rest of it, we set you up with commission, which most of our folks exceed that number. If you're ever below, we tend to help you out in terms of commission-wise, but you can really advance your pay. Many of our folks exceed what their pay plan is. And so I really liked that. I liked the ownership behind it and the fact that I had a guarantee. Even if, you know, even if everything hit the fan and the market completely tanked, I was still getting paid. And I also, I wanted to own my own business one day, but I didn't have enough money to do it. And I also didn't like the risk that it took to, you know, to do that. Because then if, you, if your business goes under, guess what? You, like, you're the one that's, that's out. Um, you know, if Enterprise Rent a Car goes out of business, which they won't, I I don't have to fork over money because I lost you know money in my venture, whatever I did. One of the so. best things about the company, as I like to share, is that we're a recession-proof industry. The fact is, our, the demand is always there. Um, since we started our business back in 1957, we've increased in profits every single year. We have not had a, de a decline in profits. We bought uh, back in '08, but you know the recession was crashing, so. A lot of companies where people were being let go, there was a lot of companies being shut down, and that's when I got hired in. Enterprise was still hiring people, we're still growing, we're still trying to uh, find great candidates like you, you know. So that's the best thing about the company, and I think that's probably the reason why I've been so loyal to this company, is the fact that I know if I'm ever let go, it's because of my performance and not because they can't afford me. Smaller. I mean, even right now, I mean, you look around and if you watch any sort of TV, what's going on in the economy right now? What's down? Anybody know? What's that? Yes. Yes, oil, right? There's, do we do, is there a big oil market in Houston? Yeah, it's massive, right? Uh, I can tell you, even with that, and you would think, you know, travel's down, corporate travel's down. I mean, we're still growing at 7 8% in Houston because a lot of our business is based off of insurance replacement, you know, and as long as people keep having accidents, which is every day, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to continue to grow and we're going to continue to have a business, which is nice. Yeah. Um, I heard you mention about sales. Is there any other way uh, that you get that sales in besides rental cars, like for instance, selling cars? Yeah. 
Yeah, great question. So what we do is, I love his shirt, by the way. Um, so what we do is, you start out as a management trainee, and Sandy doesn't have this out on here, but once you hit branch manager level, there's a lot of other arms of enterprise that open up for you. We have a fleet management division that goes out and sells kind of long-term leases to companies. You know, if you're a small business and you've got 40 cars that you consistently maintain, we'll go and we'll, we'll sell you the fact that we can do that for you. Um, then there's a car sales division too. We have enterprise car sales, which we dispose of our cars um, once we're done with them. We don't run them until they, you know, the wheels fall off. We've got to sell them somehow. We've got a car sales division that does that. That's a retail car sales lot. Um, we also we have a remarketing department that goes and sells high volume cars to a dealership. So they'll walk into dealerships and say, hey, I've got 50 cars. You know, how many of those do you want? Um, we've also we've got um, an HR department, which Sandy is a part of. Talent development, talent acquisition. So we've got tons of other stuff. We've got business rental sales, which is, you know, we go to corporations and we meet with them and we have them consolidate all of their travel expenses into one vendor who is us. Instead of just going to Expedia and booking whoever's the cheapest, we offer you a discount if you send all of your business to us. So we've got tons of other departments that spin off of just daily rental. Certainly that's our largest department, but we've got lots and lots of other avenues too. Um, once you get to that branch manager level, sometimes assistant manager. Yeah. Has Uber like affected Joe's business with like the renting? Great question. You're a forward thinker. That's good. Um, no, they haven't actually, um, because the Uber model is a little bit different than what we do. Um, they certainly they've played a little bit of a part, but what we're actually doing is we're partnering with Uber because um, they have a lot more drivers that would like to drive, but they don't have cars. And so what we've done with Uber is we've actually gone out and we've signed an agreement for their drivers to come and rent cars from us. Because when's Uber normally really busy? On the weekends is when they're normally busy. You've got people out at bars, you know, they need rides back, all that kind of stuff. We're actually slower on the weekends than we are in the middle of the week. And so it's a great opportunity for us to say, hey, if you've got drivers, here you go. How many cars do you need? And we'll rent your driver's cars and, you know, because we have a lot of cars sitting on the weekend that could be utilized that aren't. And so we're doing a pilot program with them in Denver that's apparently going really, really well. So, so most of y'all's business is during the week? It is, like, yeah. Is it like mostly business people that are just targeting? Business people flying into airports, you know, if you, if you need to go fly to Chicago or New York or whatever. I mean, a majority of our business is during the middle of the week. And then also from an insurance replacement side, like if you get in a car wreck and, you know, your car goes to the body shop, most of the time, about 60% of insurance policies out there have a replacement rental car for you while your car is in the shop because you still got to get around. Right. And so uh, body shops are closed on the weekend. And so insurance companies will take in cars on Monday to, into the body shops. And they're, normally they're done by Friday. So the rental car gets returned. So that's why we have a lot of cars that are sitting on the weekend. So that's kind of how our business works. Oh, Good right. question. Good <laughs> okay, I don't want to hit anybody. But here you go. <laughs> Oh, good well, these are great questions, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. How do your pay raises reflect the uh, interest rates? Um, you know, we have, as far as interest rates go, what we do is we evaluate every six months where our pay is competitive to, comparable to other industries and other starting positions that we have throughout the market. So we'll go and Sandy's team. We'll start going and looking at starting pay positions everywhere throughout the city of Houston in similar types of market, similar types of industries, or similar types of positions, um, and then we'll develop a competitive pay, and we always try to be above that number because we want to have the best folks. We know that people are the are our most valuable asset, and so we try to have the best folks, so we know we stay a little bit above uh, that line. Um, and then we do the same thing for assistant manager, branch manager, and we just recently did that. Um, it was probably six months ago. Pay increase yeah. in the last three years three times. Yeah. So we continue to move up. So we don't necessarily say, hey, inflation is this, so every year it's going to go up. What we do is we just take a look at the market and see who's paying what, and then we establish our starting pay based off that. A lot of companies may have a starting pay, but you also have to think about the long-term potential that the, that the company can offer you. And that's one thing that you know I sell at enterprises. 40000 that's not what I want you to make your first year. In fact, if you make 40000 you weren't as, as successful as I wanted you to be. So our goal for you is to be able to get promoted within your first 
eight to 12 months of being with a company. It just depends on your performance. And we strictly promote you based on performance. So 40,000 is the starting pay, but there's, a, like Joe mentioned, a lot of opportunity from there. Any other questions? Anything else? If you got it, feel free to ask. We'll just we'll keep going through the presentation and interject at any time. So, you know, how do you get to this point? How do you get to congratulations? When can you start? Okay, that's kind of the what you're looking for at the end of the interview process. So, Sandy's going to roll through that and kind of some, uh, you know, what to know, what to do throughout the interview process, so that you can be really, really well prepared because that interview process is really, really important. Um, there are things that happen in interviews that prevent people from getting hired. I do all final interviews for the company, um, or for my region, and I can tell you there's some definite don'ts, and if you hit those don'ts, there's no chance that you got, and there's some definite do's that if you do those things, and we have a great interview, that we'll hire you and we'll be really, really excited about you. We want to be excited about our people. Yeah, so a little bit about me. My name is Sandy De La Garza. I uh, do the recruiting for our regional office, um, which is the South Houston location <laughs> and Beaumont. I started as a manager trainee. Uh, eight months later, I became an assistant manager. I was an assistant manager for about six months, and then I was a branch manager for about two and a half years until I transitioned into the talent acquisition. So I've been in my role three and a half years. Um, I do, I come to events like this. I hire great people, bring great people to jail so he can hire them. Um, but that's really what my job is. And one of the best things I like about the company and what I do is I'm able to kind of sell the opportunities that we have. And a lot of people coming right out of college, means if you've never heard of enterprise, the first thing you're gonna think is, I don't wanna go rent cars. So that's why we're here to tell you that this is more than renting cars. Renting cars is the foundation of our business. That's the front line of the business. We're here to, we're, we're here to hire business owners, business partners. So that's what we're looking for. Renting cars, like I get people all the time and ask, ask me, why do you need a degree to rent cars? Again, because I'm not looking for somebody to rent cars. Anybody can do that, right? So I'm looking for someone to run the business and to grow our business. So what we're going to talk to you guys about is how to prepare for life after college. Who here, first of all, how many seniors do we have here? Everyone's, okay, juniors? All right, so we have internship opportunities for you guys. What about sophomores? Freshmen? Okay, awesome. So it's a great crowd. Um, how many of you have a career of seniors? How many of you have a career already? Raise your hand up high and proud. It's kind of, sort of? Okay, all right. So graduation's around the corner. Um, do you all know how many seniors you'll be graduating with? Coming? Probably several hundred thousand, maybe, if you're talking about Houston and any other market. So that's what you're competing against. A lot of times we come out of college just simply because we have the degree, we're ready. Anyone's going to hire us. Everyone's going to hire me because I have a college degree. But what we're looking for is what's going to set you apart from everybody else. And it's not just your resume. It's not just because you have a degree. It's also your experience and how you are able to sell yourself in an interview. So that's what we're going to teach you guys on. Um, resume builder. Who has a resume ready to go? Most of you, some juniors, okay, all right. Well, for the juniors, you know, it's great if you get started today. So everything you do going forward, you want to add it to your resume. How many of you have taken advantage of the Career Center to be able to help you make sure that the resume looks presentable? Is it a page? Two pages? Is it a book? Two pages? Okay. So the ma majority of you are recent college grads. You probably don't have two years' worth of experience and if you do, that's more of like maybe Joe's level. If you're a VP of a company and now you're trying to get into that kind of high level position, then you want to be able to sell yourself a little bit more. But for recent college grads, my recommendation is a page. You, know, you just want to be able to get to the point, sell yourself within the first half of the page, because a lot of times recruiters will just skim through that, just to be able to get what really stands out. Yeah, the easier it is to look at, the better the resume is. Honestly, and we, you know, the, Sandy, I don't know how many hundreds of resumes you go through in a month. But you know, if you're writing like a paragraph style, don't do that. Bullet points, because that'll help. That'll help people understand who you are and what you're all about a lot better than you know reading through. Uh, especially when I do interviews, if it's at the third interview step with me, typically I'm just I'm focusing on your degree, 
I'm focusing on you know what your GPA was throughout school, what you're looking for in a company, and if you have some sort of experience you know outside of just going to school. That's that's what I'm looking for mainly. And then the rest of it is the interview and how you communicate who you are. So besides preparing yourself, you also want to make sure that you're researching the company. You know what kind of company. I'm sorry, you're over here. I don't need to give you my back. Um, you're researching the company. You know what you want. So how many of you have an idea of what you want out of college, like, out of a career? Like, you have five things that are important to you, and if they don't have that, you're not going to consider them. You do? Mm -hmm. Great. Anybody else? So this is a time that you should already know. What's important to you? Is it money? Is it opportunity? Is it stability? Security? So all of these things are really important for somebody while well, they're already working for a company, but it should be important to you today. You want to know hey, this is something that I want to look for. So when you start researching a company, and you, you're already looking at some things that are important to you. Because a company's going to interview you, but at the same time, you're going to have the opportunity to interview us and say, hey, okay, do you match what I need for my future? Um, philosophies, promotions, training programs. Do you want to go for a company that's not going to offer opportunities or grow or any training at all? They're just going to throw you and figure it out. If you have a degree, you can do it. What's important to you? Stability, risk. Again, risk, is that something that are you willing to take? Will you take a position that's going to pay you $100,000, but maybe six months down the road, you might have to start from square one again? Work environment. Do you want to work for somebody in a, in a cubicle type setting, or do you want to interact with customers? Do you want to be, able, do you want to be the person that you know, has the say? You know, maybe one day be an RVP like Joe, and have more of decisions at that point. So it, you want to figure out what's important to you. And hopefully this is kind of an eye opener for a lot of you today. So resumes. We talked a little bit about it already. Um, written and verbal. This is the first opportunity that you get to kind of get in front of a, a recruiter. A lot of times we're, we're sending our resume out there to different companies and hoping someone's going to call us. How many of you have done that? You have no idea really what you're sending, who you're sending them to. You're just hoping someone's going to call you. And when they call you, what do you do? Who are you again? What company are you with? Um, so what's going to stand out? A lot of times you want to make an objective. Is an objective important? It can be if you're applying for a specific company or specific industry and you know exactly what that company is for, what, what, what you're applying for. So if you're submitting your resume to a specific company, you want to know, hey, this company offers this, then you want to make sure the objective is towards that. Now, if you're submitting your, your resume to several companies, then you probably want to remove objective. Yeah, and I would just tell you just to pay attention. You know, sometimes she'll get resumes that have, you know, in the objective line is to work for a different company. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're submitting that resume that you've built for that company to her to work at Enterprise. So that's a that's a red flag for us. That means that you just you're not paying attention. And so if you're going to do it, the ones that we like are the ones that are tailored specifically for us. You know, my objective is to work in a fast-paced environment to advance in a management program. Beautiful. That's great. That's exactly what we want. Uh, so just pay attention when you submit those. You know, click on the right the right one that you are submitting when you turn in your application. So again, that's the first point of contact that you have with the recruiter, and you're hoping that your resume stands out enough from thousands of resumes that a recruiter will see to be able to contact you. So again, what's going to set you apart from everybody else and all the other resumes? Um, your, your name, your email, and your phone number. Email is probably the most important thing because sometimes a lot of recruiters will contact the email, but also your phone number. So the email, make sure it's a professional email. You know, you don't want to have naughty girl one two three four five at hotmail.com you laugh but it's i see that a lot you know and your voicemail um a lot of times the recruiter will call you so we get your voicemail i don't want to hear a fake voicemail that hi ah, sorry it's just kidding or the ringtone or a foot or a, or a song it may be your favorite song but it's not mine so you want to make sure that your voicemail is very professional if that's the number you have on your resume that's the professional number that you should have, a professional voicemail you should have ready as of today. And verbal interview skills and phone etiquette. If you're, prepared, if you're applying for a company and you're submitting your application to a company, my advice to you is print 
um, a brief summary of the company, some fun facts about the company, things that stand out to you, maybe some questions that you may have. That way when they call you, and then maybe you're, maybe you're prepared, maybe you're not prepared, but you can probably let them know, hey, you know what, this time doesn't, doesn't work, but can we reschedule for two o'clock this afternoon, whatever. Pick the time that you're gonna be able to give them your undivided attention. If you have a phone interview, make sure that you're, there's not any noise in the background. Pretend you're in, a, in an interview room ready to do the interview, okay? So when I say print fun facts about the company, you already have some fun facts about the company that you can kind of go to really quick to kind of get a brief um, refresher about the company and be able to be ready for the interview. So hopefully that will help. Any questions on that? Any questions? So another company, obviously doing your research, it's really important, knowing a little bit about the company, being able to call. How can you do research besides Google? What are some other ways to research about the company? Yeah? Talking to recruiters, okay. What else? Yeah. Go to the company, maybe pick up the phone and call some people that work for the company and ask them questions. Um, there's LinkedIn, there's a lot of social media uh, right now currently, so you research the company, you find some people and you connect with them. You never know who you're going to meet, right? Looking for things that are important to you, a great job description, so obviously you want to make sure that this is a company that you can really see yourself working with. Um, and having a resume that's focused towards that. Again, I can't emphasize that enough. A lot of times I get a lot, of, like Joe says, resumes that'll say, interested in a career in accounting, but I'm not hiring for accounting at the time. Um, we do hire accountants, just so you know. The 99% of our MT positions go through a management training program. The other 1% come from like outside of our part-time positions and our accounting team. That's the only other position that I will hire. So anybody in accounting, interested in an accounting career, there, we do have opportunities every, every now and then for that. Any questions? Oh, you just sit over here. <laughs> okay, so the do's. Joe and I are probably tag team on this, um, only because he gets to see a lot of the interviews that I send him. Um, typically, in our, in our process, I handle the first phone and the face-to-face -face interview, and then I send the second to the area manager, and then the third and final interview will be with my regional vice president and possibly my human resource manager. So, practice. How many of you get in front of a mirror and practice pretending you're talking to somebody when you're preparing for an interview? Or videotape yourselves or record yourselves or go with a friend and sit down and have them practice one-on-one -on -one with you? Just you? Nobody else? Uh, you over here? <laughs> all right. So two of you and all, the majority of you are seniors. Practice makes perfect. The way you practice is the way you perform. How many times have you heard that? Never? First time? Okay, so really it's important that you get in front of a mirror and you talk to you and you kind of listen to how you're, you're presenting, ask yourself a couple questions and then look at yourself and then kind of go from there. Uh, arrive early. So what's early? 15 minutes 15. Okay, 15 minutes is perfect. Um, if you get there, because if you try to get there an hour before the interview, um, my advice is sit in the car, relax. A lot of, a lot of times you want to get there early because you're scared of the Houston traffic or the Beaumont traffic. Um, but sit in your car, relax, take a deep breath, you know, kind of review your notes, and um, walk into the building 15 minutes before. So if you're on time, you're late. If any, anything past 15, anything earlier than 15 minutes, you're showing a little bit. Probably a little desperate, right? You don't want to show that you're desperate. Um, bring copies of your resume. A lot of times we submit our resumes online and we assume they already have my resume, I don't need to take it. If you take a, a clean copy of your resume, maybe it's on a better paper, a better format, it's always important. And I would always bring at least two or three copies, you never know who's going to be sitting in the interview with you. Fresh breath. A lot of you guys probably think that's silly, but it's important. So. For those of you who like to chew gum before the interview, if you forget to spit it out, you know, my recommendation is probably just swallow it at that point. Um, but make sure that you don't chew gum in an interview, okay? Eye contact. So what we're looking for, we're looking for confident individuals, someone who's not afraid to be, um, to get in front of people and be approachable. So eye contact is really important in, throughout the entire interview. No matter what position you're applying for, 
you want to make sure to maintain great eye contact. If you're a little nervous, that will, that will probably make your nerves go away because you want to be confident. Smile. So if you're applying for a company that's, not, that's looking for people that don't smile, then that's your choice. But if you want to come work for a fun, energetic kind of company, then you probably want to be yourself. You want to show the recruiter, this is who I am. Be confident, smile. Don't think that because you're in an interview you have to be serious and very professional. You want to, you want to at the same time be yourself. Okay? Yeah. I think what's important there is at the end of the day, people want to hire folks that they're going to enjoy working with too, right? We all have a job to do and we want you to do well, but we also want to walk into an office that we're there, you know, 40, 50 hours a week, whatever it is, and have somebody there that we enjoy seeing every day and we enjoy working with. I mean, sometimes you see your coworkers as much or more than you see your family. And so you want the people that you surround yourself with just to be fun and be, you know, energetic. And if you can convey that in an interview setting too, that is great. Firm handshake. So how many of you have practiced your handshake? Good. Just because I'm a female and you're a guy, you're gonna come and shake my hand, I don't need a weak handshake. You know, you wanna be assertive, you wanna be aggressive, you're here for business, and let's and, and act on it. Then the handshake is probably the first impression that I'm gonna get. If I get a weak handshake, I'm not impressed. And accentuate the positive. When you're in an interview, you do not wanna focus on the negative. Everything, even if you had the, most, the worst experience in your last job, we, we just wanna focus on the positive, okay? Why did you leave your last position? Oh, my manager was terrible. Probably want to say there is no opportunity, no growth, whatever it is that you're looking for going forward, but you don't want to focus on the negative. Any questions? You guys are quiet. <laughs> the don'ts. Okay, don't arrive on time or late. We went over that. Don't talk too much. I know sometimes when you're nervous, you, you tend to kind of talk and talk and talk and don't know when to stop. And try to focus on the question, listen to the question, and make sure to answer the question um, and try not to go off subject. Chewing gum, kind of covered that already. Inappropriate language. There may it may be simple to you like saying the S word, you know, or the or the you know, stupid or sucks, whatever. You, it's it's very normal to say you're like thinking that that's not a bad word, but it's inappropriate. In an interview, you don't want to say anything like that. You want to make sure that you're saying appropriate professional words. And I've had it many times, and I'll tell the individual, don't say that anymore going forward if I really like them. Cell phones. We can survive without our cell phones. I promise you will survive for an hour or two. Leave your cell phones in your car. If you put it on vibrate, I can still hear it. We can still hear it. If it, if it beeps or if it rings by accident or alarm goes off, you don't want that to be a distraction. So just leave your cell phones in your car. Less is more. The less things you have with you, the better. Don't look at your watch or don't even try to look for a time or ask for the time when you're in an interview because the interview will end probably the time you do that. If the second somebody looks at their watch, I assume that they probably have some work better to go and don't have time for me, so I will probably end the interview at that time. Um, so and it's, it's rude. It may be a habit, and if it's a habit for you to do that, probably don't wear a watch. And don't assume anybody you meet is not important. So in the interview in my office, for example, I will have the applicant sit in the, in the lobby for a few minutes. Joe's office is literally down the hall. So he's in and out of the building a lot. Just because you see somebody maybe not dressed in a business suit or dressed in a suit, don't assume that someone in a suit is probably more important than the person not in a suit. Maybe that's jean day and it's casual day or Joe's wearing a polo shirt and he comes and says hi to you. You don't really make that in first impression, he's probably going to come into my office and say, hey, you know that guy or that girl, what, what was going on? Um, the person in the front, the, the, the secretary, getting your name and letting us know that you're there, she's probably the first one to come to my office and say, okay, I really like them. They were so interactive. They were very talkative. I love them. How did they do with you? Or they'll come into my office and say, they were kind of rude, you know, or they weren't even talking at all. They were really quiet. So again, when you're waiting in the lobby, make sure to be very interactive. Yeah, and oftentimes they will, like my executive assistant that sits outside my office, oftentimes when I'm walking the candidate out and I'm coming back, they'll make a comment. They'll go, hey, they were really good. Did you, like, are we hiring that person? Because they want to see you too, because they, they want to work with you as well. So, you know, don't, don't look past that person that, you know, oftentimes has the ear of the person that's the decision maker. Yeah. 
ask you the question, what's an appropriate uh, pause? Like, say you're reflecting on the question. If you don't want to be quiet too long, if you want to have, like, a ready answer, if you don't want to say anything, like, what would you consider too awkward for you guys as a pause or... Yeah, I think for me it's just, hey, gosh, that's a really good question. You know, give me just a moment to, to make sure I give you my best answer, and then you'll know when it's too awkward. I mean, for me, it's, you know, you get to 10, 15 seconds, and it's, okay, yeah, come on. Um, you know, because you're also, people are looking for, especially us, we are looking for quick thinkers, and people that are, that are on their feet and are good communicators. So... Um, yeah, I think you'll, you'll be able to judge that in the interview, but I think that's a good transition to say, huh, it's a great question. You know, give me just a minute so I, make, I can make sure I can give you my best answer. Do you want a car? <laughs> I want a car. <laughs> well, Cars are going. Going. You gotta ask a question. Uh, okay, well I'm in debt now. <laughs> you just gotta get out of debt. You gotta get out of debt by the end of the interview. Yeah, right? Okay, yeah. yes. Do you have a question? Not yet. Even not in your head, like a lot. <laughs> um, so dressing and being prepared for the interview, what's not, what's appropriate? <laughs> your dress affects the perception, uh, everybody's perception of you. So the way you dress today, we're in college. We're here to have fun. We get to dress casual. Enjoy it while you can. You get to grow those long, scruffy beards. You get to dress in khaki shorts and t-shirts and sandals. Again, enjoy it while you can. Um, there'll be a time and place, but again, for the interview, you want to make sure you're ready. So how many of you seniors, especially, have a suit ready to go for your interviews? Full matching suit. Yes? Great. Juniors? I would invest in one. As of today, you know, your, your, your goal is to find a career. Your, your graduation is just around the corner. So a lot of you can afford tennis shoes, really nice shoes, really nice dresses to go out, you can afford a, a good one good suit, at least for the interview process. Um, there's a lot of great places where you can get, get them for discounts. You can go to your career center and they can kind of guide you and work the best places you can go to, okay? Take advantage of that. So daily personal hygiene, of course, making sure for the interview that you're, you've showered, you're groomed. Now, if you're going into an interview, you're not really sure exactly if this company allows facial hair or not. Um, the first interview, I would probably, if it doesn't bother you, I would probably shave it off. Make sure you go in very neatly. You know, if you, if it's hard for you to let it go, then maybe ask in the first interview, is this okay? Um, or even if maybe if when they call you to schedule an interview, what is your facial hair uh, rules or guidelines? Um, calling people that work for the company and asking them, but making sure it's neatly trimmed if you do have any facial hair, tattoos, piercings, all that fun stuff. Um, again, I wouldn't show that at the interview, um, only because unless you're applying for a, a, a tattoo parlor or somewhere that they that they allow that and they, uh, they, they they embrace it, but if it's a company, a professional company, a lot of the times that's not really allowed. So I would make sure you hide any tattoos, limit your piercings. I just I think more of the story is just err on the side of being safe. You know, like later on if you find out, hey, this company is great, they let me grow beards and they let me have piercings and whatever it doesn't matter. Then, then you get to do it. But I think you just get through the interview process, and then you know whatever you figure out the company culture is after that, you, you can do. Okay, and and understanding the difference between casual business casual and business professional. So do you all, do the majority of you understand the difference between all three? Yes. No. Okay, great. I'm going to show you a picture. So casual dress. You know, this is your everyday casual, and this is for work, business purposes. If you're already employed in a company, com your, your employer tells you, hey, tomorrow's casual, you can dress casual, this is kind of an idea of what you would expect your employee to wear. Yeah, college casual, or college casual is different than actual casual. Yes. <laughs> so you guys, I mean, like hoodies and shorts and flip-flops is a whole different level of casual. Although it's awesome, that's what casual means in the workplace. <laughs> business casual. So maybe for guys, um, it, it, this gentleman here is wearing a polo shirt, but business casual can also be the way Joe, Joe's dressed today, you know, just wearing a, just a plain shirt, maybe loosening his tie, and not maybe not even having a tie. That's business casual. Um, but you don't, my, my biggest advice, if you're not sure, always overdress because you can always 
remove the tie. You know, so if you're not sure if you should wear a tie or not, wear the tie, you show up to the event, you notice everybody's not wearing ties, and you can go ahead and take it off. Females, um, probably what you would wear with a suit, but not a jacket. You know, so if I take off my jacket right now, then I'm just business casual. Having my jacket makes me more business professional. Um, probably would be dressed a little bit more business professional, but I'm pregnant, so, so you guys can see. Um, but this is business dress. So skirts, pants for females, either one, as long as it's a matching suit, is business professional. Same thing with guys. I mean, well, not the same thing. Suit pants with guys. Um, my advice is grays, blacks, blues um, are the safe and safe colors to probably buy if you're shopping for a suit today just because you can probably wear that suit a couple times in the week without being noticed. Now if you go bright, brighter colors, I don't see, I don't recommend it, um, but stripes or anything like that, I would probably avoid it. Yeah, the best thing for guys is whatever the president wears, that's the easiest thing to wear. Honestly, I mean, that's the power suit, and you know, they wear those for a reason, because their research tells them that they're more likable, you know, if they wear those types of clothes. Honestly, that's what they do. And so that, that for guys is probably the easiest thing is just go and pull up presidential attire and that's what you wear. I always tell individuals as well, just for the job you want, not the one you have. If you see yourself as a CEO one day, you want to start looking like one. You make a good impression not only in the interview, but th throughout your entire career. And that really stands out. You know, Joe can probably pick, pick, uh, pick a couple employees currently today that always look sharp and who are always really representing the, themselves and the brand correctly. So it's important to always remember that not just because you got the job doesn't mean it ends there. You know, you want to be able to kind of always make sure you're building your brand positively. Any questions on this? Okay. I've got a conference call I've got to run to, but it was awesome meeting with you guys. I'll be around afterwards too if you guys want to come up, ask any questions. I've got some cards and stuff that I'll link for you too. Thanks, Justin. Yes. So now you just have me. <laughs> She'll do great. Yeah. Okay. So professionalism was hired. Again, just because you have the job doesn't mean that you're, it ends there, right? You want to be able to always make yourself um, re represent your brand as best as you can. So a lot of us who have terrible brands today, it's okay. You can start fresh once you start your career. However, social media is always going to be something that's going to catch up to you, right? So making sure that all our Facebook, MySpace, whatever you guys have, I don't know, MySpace is not great, right? No, okay. Facebook, LinkedIn, all of those are professional. How many of you have a LinkedIn page? Good, I see about maybe five, ten hands. I have a LinkedIn account, so if you want to connect with me, I'm hoping you all will connect with me afterwards. Um, and I kind of shared a lot of the opportunities that we have currently on, okay? Be polite and use manners. Wait. Uh, be polite and use manners. So even once you get the, the company, you want to make sure anybody who you meet with, that you want to be able to interact with them. And of course, you want to be polite. Even if you think this person's not going to be important to you in your career, you never know where your career will take you and who you'll be reporting to one day. So making sure that you're appropriate with everybody. Accept constructive criticism and learn from your mistakes. So if, I, if I'm in, a, as in, in my career, I think the hardest part for me was being patient, right? I wanted to move on to the next level. So I quickly had to be very open to constructive feedback. Okay, tell me what I'm doing terrible on. I want to get to the next level. I, I don't want to be a manager training forever. Um, so being open to it and really not just saying that you can accept it, but really taking it and using it towards your career will really help you. Learning from your mistakes. At Enterprise, you will make lots of them. You know, We encourage you to make mistakes because you're only going to get better from them. It's okay. If you make a mistake, if you're my employee, you make a mistake, guess what? I'll fix it. Don't worry about it. Um, but I want you to be better. I want you to make decisions. I want you to be take risks. So if you come up to me and say, Sandy, hey, I was a branch manager and my employee came up to me and says, Sandy, I'm having a hard time with, you know, with this customer. They're talking about this. And I said, do what you need to do. Just take care of it. Pretend you're the manager. I'm not here. And they do. And then I'll go back and I'll be like, okay, this, you did great. This is what I would have done. Um, or this is, or you did great, I wouldn't have done anything different. But we give you that power as a manager trainee to do that. That's the best part about the company because you're training to be a manager. Um, accept responsibility for your actions. Everyone is replaceable. 
and, and it's the harsh truth, but it is. You know, you want to know that everything you do is going to be a huge reflection on your career. So accept responsibilities. If you make a mistake, don't lie about it, okay? Don't go try to hide it because if you're honest from the beginning and it was a mistake, it really was a mistake, you're going to be okay. But if you try to hide it, you try to lie about it because you're scared you're going to get in trouble, that's when it gets worse. So I know a lot of this is like common sense and you're thinking, well, duh, you know, but it happens. It happens a lot in, 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 in my experience. I've seen it more than I wish. I, I mean, obviously, I wish a lot of people would have paid attention to this. And you think it's common sense, but again, it really does happen. So this is just an eye-opener for you guys. Stay away from rumor, mill, don't gossip. It's easy. Um, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all, and don't be a whiner. Any questions on that? You guys are really quiet. Is it after lunchtime? So even while you're in work, while you're working, while you've decided to take your career forward, you want to be able to talk about, to be, to be able to show up on time. So again, 10, 15 minutes early is being on time, right? Um, leave only when the job is done, be the last to leave. So again, if you're working for an employer that you're trying to make a great impression, trying to move up, you want to make sure you represent your, your work done as well as well, right? So. If you like to leave early and you want to come in late, you make sure you dress up with your boss, but at the same time, you want to be able to make sure your work is complete before you leave. Network. So one of the biggest things about our company is networking and being able to find mentors, someone that's going to help you and guide you through um, finding a career, moving your career forward. And we encourage that. In fact, the first day you start with us, we assign you with a mentor or a sales buddy. Um, but throughout your career, we want you to find someone that you can, you're compatible with or that you can see yourself as, as one day. You know, so hey, I want to go into the remarketing team. Then you find somebody in the remarketing team that will be your mentor and maybe help you, hey, this is what I did to get to this level, and that's what you need to probably do to get to, that, to, the, to their level. Or at least be prepared. And plus, they open a lot of doors for you. You never know, again, who you're going to meet. Maybe that guy or that girl will be the hiring manager when you're ready to go into that next level and they've been mentoring you for the past two years and it's a great opportunity for you that when an opportunity becomes available, guess who they're going to think about? You. Okay? So always reach out to any other department. In Enterprise, it's not just one career path that we offer. We have so many opportunities and as Joe mentioned, the, the doors are always open in a lot of our opportunities and we only promote from within. So I will never hire anybody from the outside in any other department or in any other division within the company that hasn't started as a manager training. Never look down on a peer, they may be your boss someday. I made that very clear already. Don't get drunk at company functions. Okay? We have a lot of functions where we offer open bar um, and we let you, you know, drink as much as you want. If you know your limits, make sure to keep it at two or three. If you don't know your limit, just make sure to hold one glass glass of wine and just hold on to it the rest of the night if you don't know your limit. A lot of you in college probably know your limit, so remember that, okay? You want to, you're always representing yourself professionally, even if it's a casual setting. So three months of generally on probation. So a lot of employers will hire you the first three months. They can let you go without any reason. So the first three months, you're probably on probation. With Enterprise, it's very hard for me to say that I will let you go after three months. If you really did something bad, and I'm saying something bad, un something unethical, then you'll probably probably be let go. But other than that, if you're not performing, we're gonna always try to find a way to help you better your career. Now, if it's a year and you're still not performing, then that's a different conversation. But in the first three months, okay, maybe this manager wasn't the best manager for you. You didn't really get the training that you deserved. So let's go ahead and consider you for another manager and give you a different feel of the business. Um, so there's always going to be an opportunity for you to be able to advance. It just depends on you. You also have to reach out, so don't be afraid to do so. Um, choose two or three people to be your mentors. I've already talked about that. Remember your recruiter and your boss may hear at your answering machine email too. We talked about that. Um, keep your boss informed, never surprised. Again, make sure if you have any planned trips or anything like that, you want to make sure to always let your employer know. Um, take coworkers from other departments out to lunch and ask them about their work. Same thing as asking for a mentor. 
And maybe that you don't want them as a mentor, but you just want to pick their brain. And I have some of my employees come and ask me all the time, hey, I want to join the HR, I want to, be, I want to do what you do. Can we go have lunch? Or I'll invite them to lunch. Yeah, let's go, let's go have lunch and see, and I can share with, with you what I did or my career path and how you can make, maybe transition into my role one day. <clears throat> I want to get promoted. I want to move out. Um, my, role would, my role is a little bit different. It's not a very fast career path like the rental career path. My role is a little bit slower um, of a, as far as progression within the company, so it doesn't take me, I can't be like an RVP in five years. It could probably take me 10, 15 years to be kind of that level as a recruiter in my company. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm out of breath a lot. This world's like on my lungs. I'm having a girl, by the way. Um, so take coworkers from other departments up. Uh, find a mentor, key backup tools in your car. So if it's a setting where they tell you to dress a certain way, you're not really sure, I would always recommend to have some good tools in your car. However, if you're um, working working at the, at the company and there's um, you happen to get dirty, it's always safe to have a nice clean shirt or maybe a jacket in your car just in case somebody important walks in, right? So, is any of this helpful? Are you guys finding that you, is it common sense? It is, right, a lot of it. But again, it's, it's an opportunity for you guys to be able to get ready for life after college. Um, know your boss's boss, and boss's spouse, and your boss's assistant. Why is that important? Uh, different ways to get in touch with your boss. <laughs> okay, yeah, that. But also it shows that you care about somebody, you know, that you make, you took that extra effort. You can call it kissing butt or whatever, but it's not. You know, you're making that extra step to talk about when you, when you meet with your boss, you have a good five minutes to kind of talk about something that's not related to the topic you're about to sit down and talk about. So it's your jelly bean, right? You're kind of trying to make sure to have something, some fun conversations. You ask about their kids. Um, you want to make sure that you're very respect respectable to their to their assistant. That person helps that my RVP run the business. I mean, that's the person's right hand right hand man. Um, listen, eighty percent of the time, talk twenty percent of the time. So whenever you're talking to somebody, I know a lot of us like to talk. I'm a talker. I can talk all day long. Um, so I kind of have to limit myself. I want to make sure I listen, and again, make sure to not show that I'm kind of trying to take over the conversation. Limit your romance to your life outside of the office. So like I've been told, don't get your honey where you make your money, okay? <laughs> it's gonna happen probably, but a lot of the times it can probably cause a lot of problems. So that's just our advice, you do what you want, but please take that seriously. Um, ask for a raise because you're worth the money, not because you want more money. So one thing that is, you, you can go into a company and you can sound a little bit of a whiner. You can say, I deserve it, I deserve it, I deserve it, I want a raise. Um, when you come in and you talk to your RVP and you ask for a raise, you want to make sure you have some facts about your career and where you're at today to be able to earn it. Give me facts. Give me something, show me something on paper. Show me a resume, your, your career resume. Why, why do you deserve a raise? You're doing everything that's expected, okay? That's expected of you. But what's setting you apart from everybody else to be able to ask for that? And I've had sitting down females, I'm sorry, guys, it's easier, right? If you guys can maybe, maybe some of you may be able to go into and ask for a raise. A lot of times females are a little bit more timid and, you know, a little bit more, um, I guess, afraid of the person saying no or being shut down. Don't be, you know, that's the conversation I've had to have, I've had to have a couple times in my career. And it's, it's very hard going in that building or going into that room and asking for a raise, but it's an opportunity for you to be like, hey, you know what, this is what I've done, this is what I've accomplished, now let's talk about my opportunities going forward. Okay, so don't be afraid. Be ready to give a 30 second description of your company to friends, neighbors, and family. If you're working for a company that you love, um, and that's one thing that I've had to encounter my entire career, Anytime I tell anybody I work for Enterprise, they're like, oh, you rent cars. And if I want to, I'm just like, yeah, I rent cars. But I don't, I never stop there. I mean, I, I'm very proud of my company and I love what I do. Even when I was in the management role, when I was a branch manager, that was my business. I ran it. I did everything that went out of that location, everything, 
Every car that was running out of it was my car. That was my business. It almost became Sandy rent a car. I, I owned, I treated it like that because again, I got paid on the bottom line of the business. So I was like, yeah, renting cars is the easy part. I mean, I can do that all day long with my eyes closed. It's not even difficult at all. But it's being able to manage the business, learning the, the how to be profitable, how to train and develop your team, how to be able to increase um, growth. So there's so many parts of the business, the accounting side of the business. I'm not an accountant. I hate accounting. I've never been good at it. But I have to learn my financials, my accounting side of the business in order for, for me to find success. I wanted to know, okay, where was I hurting to be able to make more money? At the end of the day, what motivated me was money. I wanted to make money. And I saw the opportunity and the potential that I had with this company, so that's what motivated me. Um, everybody has something different that motivates them. Right now, it's my family, my kids. So my one child and my future kid, right? But that's what's gonna motivate me, being able to know that I can give my children everything they want of course, not give it to them, but know that I can. Um, so 30 seconds description of the company. I sometimes go a little bit overboard, but being able to be, be proud of who you work for, and if you're not, kind of regather your thoughts and maybe reconsider your career path. But it's important for you to love what you do and love who you work for. I don't want to go over, and last time I went over, so I'm trying to go through it a little bit fast. Um, <clears throat> set financial goals. So a lot of times, we're going to work for a company that's going to start us off at 80000 By the way, the majority of you, recent, you're recently about to, you're about to graduate this thing. Um, what is the starting pay or starting salary that a lot of you are expecting? It's an opportunity for you to get involved, by the way. Well, I have a question. Later. Yeah. Um, I would expect um, 50,000. 50, 50, 50, yeah. Okay. What's your question? Um, it, it can be laid out at the end. It's about a resume. So if you want to. Yeah, yeah. Me. If you all have resumes and you want me to look at them afterwards, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah. And I'll be happy to take them as well. I'll ask it later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other? 50,000? 60? 60,000 is the minimum. Do you have experience, work experience already? At least five years with the same company, solid work experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, and mm -hmm. it's an employer that will probably start you at 60. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's more like the company that I was working for. Okay, yeah, so 60, 50 is what I hear a lot. Um, <clears throat> I do a lot of research on the average salary for a lot of recent college grads. When I graduated college, <clears throat> I thought it was 50 and it was 30. Um, <clears throat> and so there's a lot of different starting salaries. It just depends on the employer. Now, if you're going for a specific profession, which is like engineering, or you're going to be the architect, or, or a specific company, that may be the starting salary. But in the business in the business world, starting entry level, the starting salary averages about thirty-five to 40000 It just depends. Um, I've had, and the reason I ask that is because I have a lot of people that always give me the look, like, oh, it's 40. Again, I don't, I don't expect you to make 40 your first year. In fact, I expect you to make 50, the, your first promotion to assistant manager is 49 with a 750 bonus. So you're already at 50,000 within your first nine to 12 months. Joe got there in eight months. I got there in eight months. Why can't you? You know, it's it's the hard work and the effort that you make to get to that level. Um, how many of you expect more? How many thought 40 was the average? Okay, good. Um, of course, it's going to go up, but you have to think about, okay, so if a company's paying you at 60, 60, 50,000, where do you see yourself in five years? Are you still going to be making 60,000? And that's important for you to ask, and it's okay to ask for pay in the interview. Don't think because you're in an interview, you can't ask. This is, again, you have the opportunity to interview the employer. They interviewed you, now you have to be able to interview them. So you have to be able to sell each other both ways. Um, so 60000 is important to you. You want to be able to say, okay, so what's the opportunity that I have five years down the road? You know, <laughs> what, what does my career look like in the next two years if you want to see a fast progression? Um, is the pay consistent? Is the pay, do you get the better pay? Your title may change. You may have more responsibility, but your pay will still remain the same. Okay, so you want to be able to ask those questions as well. So don't assume because you're making 80000 right out of college that you're set for life and you just go out and buy a brand new car and you start spending all this money. 
you never know where that career can take you. Remember, the first three months you're on probation, and you don't know if their career is a lot of advancement. Now, if you see it firsthand, if you see that there's a lot of people above you that started where you did and are now making great, great money and are moving up and there's some great um, stability within the company, then that's okay. Maybe I would take a little bit of a risk, right? And that's what I'm able to see at Enterprise. I know that everybody above me started in my shoes at one point. And I see the opportunity, and I see the progression, and I see the emails coming in with promotions, opportunities within the company. So that to me was like, okay, it's actually real. It's actually happening. So that's important for you to find out with any employer that you work for, if it's important to you. Um, making sure you're saving for rainy days. Again, the, the opportunities within the company may slow down. The pay may be 61 a month, but then they may say, hey, we're going to have to cut everybody's pay to 40 or whatever it is. Um, so make sure you're prepared for that. Um, plan for your retirement. How many of you are planning for retirement right as soon as you graduate from college? You have your 401ks, Roth IRAs, you have all that ready? Do you all know what that means, most of you? Who doesn't? Not to call you out, but if you don't, maybe it's time for you to start looking at it, right? Um, so retirement is really important. Benefits. How many of you how many of you are looking for companies that offer benefits? Hopefully all of you. Okay, so benefits is important. We have great benefits with enterprise as well. You know, medical, dental, vision, 401k, and profit sharing, and we pay a huge, huge percentage of it, so it's a really great deal. And re reward yourself only after meeting goals. So I'm going to have you guys read this because I want to interact. I want people to interact, okay? I want you guys to read some of the things that are going to be pulled up here. Now, 11 things you did not learn in school, and I want you to kind of tell me what you think about it. This is from Bill Gates. I thought it was, a lot of them were pretty silly, but again, it's common sense. So we'll start with you. Life is not fair. Get used to it. Okay. So again, a lot of times we graduate from college, we assume because I have a college, I have a college degree, everyone's going to hire me. I'm going to find a job easily. How real is that? It's not. It happens so much. I get a lot of employees, a lot of students that I met with a couple years ago when I started, and I'm thinking, and now they're still looking for a job, or I see them on their LinkedIn and they've gone from job to job to job, or they're just so focused on that one company that they forget about everybody else. My friend over here. The world won't care about your self-esteem. The world will expect you to accomplish something before you feel good about yourself. Okay, well, can you tell me about that? Um, basically, every day you just got to go um, carrying yourself as in you, how you want the world to see you because what's happening behind is only self inflicting So it doesn't matter. Exactly. Leo in the blue. Aww. You won't be vice president of the company with the car phone until you earn it. Okay. So. Uh, one thing I'd like to share about Enterprise is you get a company car once you become a branch manager. I've been with a company, I th um, this August, this April will be eight years, and I haven't paid for gas, a car note, car insurance, maintenance, if I drive a brand new car every day for six and a half years. So within the first one, a year and a half, I didn't have to worry about that. I bought a brand new car right out of college. Silly mistake, you know, and I teach people, don't, I tell people in my interview process, if you have that old beat up college car, keep it. Your goal is to get promoted soon. Don't buy a new car. Um, but it worked out with me because I was able to kind of hand it out to my parents, but I haven't had, I haven't owned a car since I've been with the company practically. So again, don't assume everything right out of college, you assume you're going to find your career and you're going to get hired and everyone's going to want you. Um, you're very marketable, you are, because you have a degree, but at the same time you're competing against thousands of other students who are graduating with you. You. If you think that your teacher is tough, wait until you get a boss. Your boss said it has to be Okay, I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, your boss doesn't care. Your boss is just, he's a straight shooter. And hopefully, and hopefully you're okay with that. Um, I hate for somebody to sugarcoat something and tell me, oh, you're doing okay when you're really doing terrible. In reality, it doesn't happen that way. They're going to bring you in the office and they're going to have very difficult conversations with you. Um, but, but 
they've done it so much that they're used to it. How about you, number 15 on the chart? Flipping burgers is not beneath your dignity. Your grandparents had a different word for burgers flipping. They call it opportunity. Now, a lot of us don't probably, are, are, how many of you work in fast food restaurants or industries? You are? Okay, great. Anybody else? Okay. When you work, when you went in and you applied for them, did you show up in shorts and t-shirts? How did you show up? Professionally. Professionally. So it doesn't matter what position you're applying for. Always treat every position like it's the next CEO position that you're applying for. If that's what you want, right? Because you, that's, that's practice. You're practicing to prepare yourself for the better interview. And plus, you never know who you're going to meet. Hey, you know what? You look really sharp. You talk, you talk very professionally. You communicate well. Um, so I really, I was hiring you for this, but I kind of would like to consider you for a management position. Would you be open to it? You ne again, you never know where that interview can take you. Anybody else? Pink sweater. If you mess up, it's not your parents' fault, so don't whine about it. Learn from them. It's a really easy internship opportunities that I do have right now. I am hiring for interns. Our interns start May through August. It's a, May, it's a summer internship. It's a paid internship. It's $11 an hour plus scholarships at the end. You can earn $500 up to $1,500 in scholarships. Um, it's, it is, again, a paid internship for the summer. It's a great opportunity for you to really get a feel of what the business is like. You're not your typical intern. The only difference between you and a full-time employee is a title. That's it. You're going to learn everything the same way we teach our manager trainees. Um, you get the same training, the same opportunities, and then if you graduate soon, we use your internship opportunities to be able to reflect your career going forward once you graduate and if we offer you full-time. My full-time positions, I'm, I'm hiring for that always. May grads, I am taking applications as of, as of today. Um, if you need help or if you want some more questions and more a little bit, a little bit more one-on-ones, I'm happy to answer any questions. I will pass out my business cards as well and would be my contact information. In fact, sorry, I, I, I like to tweet things that are super funny. Um, okay, so that's my contact information. I'm going to be on maternity leave effective May 1st, and I'm gone for three months. So uh, put Megan's email. Megan is the my HR manager. She does all, she'll, do, she'll be in charge of all of the hiring process after May, but before May, if you want to make sure to get in touch with me, that's my email. And that's Joe's email as well if you have any questions for him um, afterwards if you want to talk to him. But since there's class here, I'll stay outside a little bit. If you all have time or you want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, I'll be happy to talk to you. If you have any resume questions, you want to just email me a resume and I can take a look at it and I can call you and kind of give you my feedback. Again, everything I share with you is just my, my opinion um, you do what works for you and what you choose to do. I've been in my role again three and a half years. I've kind of become a little bit of an expert with the interviews and the resumes um, process. So I'm, I'll be happy to share what I think is best. Um, but again, my advice is definitely taking advantage of the career center. Okay. Right. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope you all enjoyed our presentation. Thank you.